The red button is on. We are joined this morning in Senate Judiciary on February 5th, 2021, by the House Human Services Committee, uh, chaired by Representative Ed Pugh. Um, our two committees have often worked jointly on issues of child welfare and issues regarding child protection. Um, this is an outgrowth of a meeting that we held last week discussing the uh, Hubbard Bridge Treatment Program. I'm hoping it'll be a roundtable discussion with several of the witnesses. And um, we have uh, the Commissioner of uh, DCF, John Brown, uh, Sarah Squirrel, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, John Campbell from the Sheriff's Association, as well as Roger Marku, who's a sheriff in Lamoille County, who's done terrific work up there. We also have um, Marshall Paul, the juvenile defender, Jim Henry, the executive director of CEOL, uh, Selena Hickman, who is the uh, director of policy and planning for the Department of Mental Health. I believe somebody from uh, Beckett this year, um, as well as Steve Howard uh, from the VSEA. And what I was hoping we could lead off with Commissioner Brown and then kind of, I put out some questions that may not be artfully worded, but they're getting at the issue of um, how are kids exhibiting aggressive or self-harm behavior in residential or foster care dealt with uh, currently? What measures are being taken to de-escalate those situations? When there is a child in residential or foster care that has either assaults someone or causes significant property damage, what are the protocols for dealing with this? What happens when a child is taken to the hospital? Um, for a mental, I should have added in there, for a mental health crisis. Um, how is that dealt with? Um, I, my, my understanding is no, most of them are just returned to wherever they were and somebody from mental health sees them and says, yep, they're in a crisis. Um, are there problems with transport? We've heard, we, we've heard of a number of kids being held in um, police barracks and other locations awaiting a transport because uh, getting transports uh, through the sheriffs is sometimes extremely difficult. Are kids staying for a long period of time in either a hotel or at the police station? And are short-term programs being used for long-term placements? Um, I've heard that there are some kids who are intended for short-term placement that are there 90 days or longer. Um, and are juveniles being charged when they act out aggressively thereby uh, actually, it should have been uh, juveniles who are children in need of supervision who act out aggressively. Um, are they charged and thereby making them delinquent and eligible for programs like uh, the new uh, cover bridge treatment former and formerly the Woodside? So those are some of my uh, questions that maybe other committee members have of either committee have further questions, but I kind of like to lead it off with uh, Sean Brown, the Commissioner of Department of Children and Families, he needs to get to another meeting at, I think, 9.30, Commissioner. You're muted. Okay. Yes, uh, I, um, I'm able to stay until the House is off the floor and I need then need to appear in House Human Services oh, okay. Committee at well, that point. So I'm going to try well, to... Well, if the Human Services point. Committee is here, maybe you would... <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I may, Commissioner Brown, uh, we are on the, the house is on the floor at 930. So um, you may be able to uh, remain in this, in this, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but to remain in the Senate um, hearing uh, until, until it's finished, because we may be there longer. Well, you may be back here too. Um, so anyway, uh, Commissioner, if you want to lead it off and... Um, and then um, we can go to other, maybe the Department of Mental Health and then um, others, you know, like, but I would like it to be a round table where somebody from mental health can say, yeah, that's wrong, or this is right, or Jim Henry can speak up, Steve Howard can, can you know, by raising their hands, please. Oh, and I see Sheriff Anderson has also joined us. I had a great conversation with him yesterday about uh, DCF transport, and uh, I'm glad he's with us. So go ahead, anyway, sure. Commissioner. Uh, 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 good morning to uh, both committees, the Senate Judiciary and the House Human Services. Happy to be here today. 
um, and also to all of the other witnesses joining in as well. I look forward to a, a, a robust conversation this morning. Um, I would say overall, there is stress in, in our child protection and juvenile justice system um, in terms of youth, um, you know, and I think um, that there are multiple root causes of, of that stress. Um, you know, I think primarily we're seeing in the immediate term, the impact that the pandemic is having on that and just in terms of the stress it's causing for families and kids um, and the way we've had to adapt and live and the, and the precautions we need to take and the isolation that's causing. Um, also, it's really impacted how kids move through our systems of care, um, whether at the foster care level or short-term crisis level um, or um, other residential placements, just programs, you know, I've had to implement health and safety measures, um, which really slow down their ability to uh, move kids in and out of the programs as quickly as, as we've had prior to COVID. Um, and then also, you know, when there's a positive a case, you know, they need to restrict, um, you know, who can come into the program and who can leave the program, create staffing challenges and then bottle and then creates, um, I would say bottlenecks in the system. Um, you know, we have a team here at, at the Family Services Division um, that has done a really good job working with our residential system of care and team from the health department to really, uh, you know, triage those issues when they pop up to make sure that we're responding as quickly as possible um, with the health and safety of the staff of those programs and the kids and limiting the spread, but then also allowing them to hopefully get quickly as back to operational as normal. Um, you know, we recently had, uh, you know, staff positive at a program in the Bennington area. Um, and so I, you know, and I think our teams work really well on that, but, but I mean, there, we are seeing, you know, just the stress in the system due to multiple factors. I think, you know, um, they're, you know, there's, you know, the report that we submitted that you posted on your website from the uh, public consulting group identifies some areas where we could um, focus our attention in terms of increasing community supports, to make sure we're keeping um, kids um, in, in, their, in their homes and not having them need to leave for, for care or um, also, you know, support their families when they are in care so that they're ready to resume um, you know, having their child back in the home once they leave the therapeutic treatment milieu that they're in or wherever they are. Um, and then just making sure our families have the tools and our community providers have the tools um, to do the work. And I, you know, and that's, and you know, and those are longer term, I think, system issues that we all need to address. And I think they're in different areas of, of our, of our, you know, they touch in the mental health system, they, they touch in the, the Dale system, they touch in our community providers. Um, you know, DCF system of care. And so I think we need to coordinate, identify those supports that are needed and then work to create and implement those. Um, but that, that's some long-term work we need to do. In the short term, there, there are certainly um, uh, things we're working on in FSD right now to address some of the safety concerns that have popped up um, given our, uh, you know, what we're seeing for stress in the system. You know, as you indicated, you know, we are seeing um, we, in, you know, we were experiencing some issues with transporting youth, which required them to be held um, longer in, in environments that's really not good for um, anyone involved, whether the police department, our staff, uh, or the youth. Um, you know, we've been working very closely um, with the uh, Sheriff's Association and, and Sheriff Anderson and Sheriff Marcoux. Uh, we think we have a, a good solution that we're implementing that will improve that, that system. Um, you know, they've been great partners there. Um, I'll just say that we've been asking a lot of the sheriffs um, during the pandemic. Um, we we're contracting with them um, to provide security um, at multiple sites across the state um, to keep homeless families uh, safe, um, you know, given issues that are popped up. And so they're spread pretty thin right now. Um, and we just have really appreciated their partnership <laughs> and their ability to, to step up where they can. Um, and then I would say we're working with our team um, here at ES, uh, FSD to understand their safety concerns and make sure we're putting uh, new systems in place um, to make sure that they're you know, not put in those situations again, because it's not acceptable what happened um, several weeks ago with the youth in a hotel in St. Albans. And, we, and I think we all recognize that, that we need to uh, implement new measures to prevent um, you know, uh, that from occurring again. Uh, 
I just want to make clear that I, didn't, I don't want to focus on one incident because I'm aware of staff members at Sea All being assaulted and uh, broken noses and other um, injuries. I'm also aware of uh, staff members at um, the Beckett or Vermont School for Girls also in Bennington um, having uh, significant injuries. Um, it's not just um, there. And, I, and I, I think the workers' comp issue that Jim highlighted last week um, speaks to that uh, problem. Um, staff getting injured on the job and then end up with workers' comp cases. Um, I'm concerned about mental health. Um, are we sending kids who should be in the mental health system into DCF? similar to the way we handle the correction system where people, uh, adults are, end up in the, uh, mental, in the uh, correction system because mental health isn't dealing with them. What kind of a, how are you all at mental health, uh, Commissioner Squirrel or uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox dealing with the um, kids that we're seeing who are exhibiting some of these behaviors? I know they go to the, and also if you could explain, when they go to the hospital, I hear about cases where they take a kid to the hospital, they're seen by mental health, and then they're returned to the program. No, it doesn't seem anything happens. I will take that as my cue. Uh, good yeah. morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, for the record, uh, Commissioner Squirrel of the Department of Mental Health, uh, great to see everyone this morning. Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox is joining me as well. Um, and I just wanna thank Senator Sears um, for setting the table for this conversation. It certainly is an urgent and important one. I can share some high level points, Senator Sears, just in response to your very good questions. Um, I did wanna just, you know, at a high level, when we think about our mental health system of care for children and youth, we really do think about it as a continuum from promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment and recovery we have a robust system of mental health services and supports across the state that you can access at different points through that continuum. And I think we would all agree that the bottom line is the earlier we intervene, the better the outcomes. And so the more that we can focus on more of those promotion, prevention, proactive measures, the better off we're going to be in the long run. With that said, um, we know that we need targeted intervention. Um, so the vast array of school-based mental health supports that we have as well as um, the residential services, crisis bed programs and inpatient system um, that we have that support children and youth. I have some data slides that I'll follow up with these two respective committees that really look at longitudinal data related to demand for children's mental health services. Um, it actually goes all the way back to 1986 and you see this continuous increase in need and acuity. Certainly the impacts of COVID I think have amplified that um, particularly for youth ages 12 to 17. I also have data that I'll send around uh, related to access to our residential system of care. It actually breaks it out by DCF, Dale, and DMH. So you can start to see the trends in terms of children and youth accessing residential care. We did see a slight increase this year for children and youth um, through the Department of Mental Health um, accessing residential care. And so that gets to, I think, some of the complex interlocking factors that many children, youth, and their families are experiencing in terms of poverty, mental health issues for families, substance use, trauma, the whole host of things that we know are putting pressure on our vulnerable children, youth, and families across the state. I can also say that when I started my career, I actually worked in a group home. Um, I worked in a micro-residential treatment home um, at Washington County Mental Health. So I really understand what it means to do that work on a day-to-day -day basis, the intensity of need and acuity for children and youth um, who require that level of care. And I think if you talk um, to direct care staff who work um, in these programs, we really see it as our job to try to help modulate the behavior of a child or youth who might be in crisis and just also wanna remember that this all is all linked to brain science, right? We know how trauma impacts the brain. We know children and youth get into fight or flight mode and it's really our job to make sure that we can intervene um, and to try to support them uh, through that crisis escalation. 
Um, we also know that all of our efforts um, from a clinical standpoint are really focused on how do we intervene earlier so we don't end up with an escalated youth um, who might be externalizing behaviors through aggression. Um, so I just wanted to note that across that our residential system of care, you know, there's individualized treatment plans for children and youth, you know, we're really trying to understand um, what are their coping skills and strategies uh, therapeutic uh, crisis um, intervention um, is one of the evidence-based practices that many of our residential programs and crisis programs are trained in. And also getting to the intersection of mental health and DCF, you know, I know I ran school-based mental health services for over a decade in Lamoille and Caledonia County. Um, some of the um, very rural areas, a lot of intensive need within those family systems and I would say half to three quarters of the children and youth that we served in that community mental health program were also in DCF custody. Um, so there is this you know, link between children and youth who are in DCF custody and connecting them to our mental health services in a really meaningful way. So I did just wanna underscore that, that that connection and collaboration is happening um, all the time. We have many children and youth um, who are served by our community mental health agencies funded through the DMH case rate um, that are also in DCF custody. So again, I'm just trying to um, share it really as a, a network of resources and supports. Um, I would always say that we can do better. Um, and I think this conversation is an opportunity to get to that. Um, related to your question about when a child or youth um, might be escalated uh, and need to go to the emergency department. Um, and Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox can also jump in on this as well. Um, essentially, we have a network of um, QMHPs, which are qualified mental health professionals who have received special training so that they can screen children and youth. Um, and what they're really screening for is do they meet hospital level of care? Um, and obviously, all of our inpatient units, which are at the Brattleboro Retreat, um, it's all CMS federal funding. Um, so we certainly have to make sure that the presentation of that child or youth indicates that higher level of care. And so that's exactly what the screeners are doing in coordination with ED staff and other docs. Um, so that's part of the system. Um, obviously, we, that's a very restrictive level of care and can be. You can access that system voluntarily. You can access that system involuntarily. Um, but certainly it's something we take very seriously um, because we wanna serve children and youth in the community as much as possible. We also have a network of crisis beds across the state as well, hospital diversion programs through NFI that also provide services and supports um, to children and youth because there's the bookends of the system, right? We wanna um, make sure we have adequate inpatient capacity and are meeting the needs of those children and youth. We also wanna make sure that we have a strong, robust community system so that we can divert the need for those higher levels of care. Uh, can I just ask a question about the beds? And, and I'm trying to understand, I, I don't wanna, I may know too much sometimes, um, but Kid A um, is in the Washington County Mental Health Turtle Rock or Turtle, whatever it is. Um, you have two beds there, you have to move one out to get somebody else in. This is what I've heard. Um, and the kid, kid A gets moved out, who's a DCF kid, ends up at in a motel or in some other setting, which a police station or whatever, because there's a lack of beds. Is there a lack of beds in that system that is creating uh, danger for some, of, uh, for some folks for putting kids out who shouldn't be out for those? Yeah, I, I can't speak as knowledgeably to the Turtle Rock program. Um, however, what I can say is that when we think about well, our- Was Turtle Rock DCF or DMH? Yeah, and so- Senator, I thought that was Washington County Mental Health. It is, and they've you know created this, I think, <clears throat> a specialized program to support DCF and the transition um, while the Beckett program uh, is being established. Uh, certainly we have, uh, we did see decreased capacity across the state as a result of COVID, particularly in our crisis beds um, and in our inpatient capacity. I also have some data, I testified on this yesterday in house health care, um, just in terms of that capacity. 
Um, I think we all might agree that you know, demand tends to outpace resources across the system of care in general. Um, we have a children's care management team that their job 24 seven a day is managing these acute cases and the movement of cases. Um, so, you know, for what it's worth, uh, we do, I think currently at this moment in time, there's a lot of pressure on the system and there is reduced capacity. The other thing I would just note, I know Senator Sears, you were really interested um, as are we in getting to solutions as well. Um, so one that I would offer um, for both of the respective committees um, is one of the areas that we're also looking at, you know, in addition to ensuring that the systems are connected, if there are gaps in terms of referral to mental health services, I certainly wanna work with Commissioner Brown to address those. Um, we've also put forward as part of our FY22 budget recommend the implementation of mobile response um, and mobile response would really allow us to deploy um, more proactively community mental health teams to children, youth, and families in their homes prior to a crisis hitting such a threshold that you might need to involve law enforcement, that you might need a higher level of care. I would also note that this model that has been implemented in other states, particularly in New Jersey, they really focused this work um, to support um, foster families um, and for children and youth who are in a foster care situation, you know, we know that there can be escalations there that can lead to that placement being disrupted. So I think there really is an opportunity where by implementing mobile response and focusing perhaps um, on children and youth who are in foster care, we could maybe achieve some of the great outcomes um, like our friends in New Jersey did. Um, they had almost all of the foster um, children who entered foster care who had mobile response were able to remain in their placement. So I just offer that as another potential solution area that we should all be thinking about. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there and see if Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox has anything that he'd like to add. I think the, the piece that I would just like to, to address, I know that uh, Senator Sears, you brought up the, the question of, uh, uh, youth being brought to the hospital, uh, being seen and sent back to a to a program. Uh, I think I think you have both. You you do have uh, uh, youth who are brought into an emergency room to be screened and are sent back, if you will, and some that aren't. Uh, you know, I think what just so that everyone's on the same playing field as far as what they're looking at, uh, they're really trying to determine if the the behaviors the dangerous behaviors you know whether it be assaultive or self-injurious is that really a result of uh, a mental illness you know their depression causing them to hurt themselves or severe anxiety uh, or even psychosis causing them to assault someone else or is it a function of uh, not having uh, having poor coping skills that they have not been able to develop so that they can manage frustration and anger at their current situation. Uh, you know, youth will, you know, having been a youth uh, not too long ago, but about 40 or 50 years ago, you know, uh, you know, we act out, uh, you know, as kids when we're frustrated and, you know, when a child is placed in custody that, and they're being told they can't leave a placement or something of that sort, uh, that's an incredibly frustrating situation for anyone, let alone for a youth, uh, uh, who's really working on trying to develop their, their coping skills. And so let me try to describe, of, let me just you know, describe just, a situation and then you can respond to that. And back in the day when I was working in residential treatment, I used to say that it was tougher to get a kid into Woodside than it was to get a kid into Harvard. Um, and I'm not sure that isn't true today of getting somebody into the retreat, but kid, Kid uh, A uh, smashes furniture, assaults a staff member. They take the kid to the emergency room in Bennington at the Southwest Vermont Medical Center, seen by somebody from the designated agency in Bennington United Counseling Service. <clears throat> and instead of sending the kid to someplace else, sends that same kid back into the environment that he just was acting out against. It's just, I mean, there are certain, yeah. you know, he's already committed two, at least two crimes that would be, uh, if he were an adult, it could be charged with. 
serious crimes, assaulting a staff member, over a thousand dollars worth of physical damage to the building or to the furnishings or whatever. And they're told, you know, send them back. And they're frustrated. They will try to work with DCF. They don't want to get, get rid of the kid, but maybe the kid needs to be in a place like the retreat, but you can't get in there. That's well, I, I um, think it might be, I think it might be more that the, in that type of situation that you're describing, uh, even though we don't want to talk about uh, particular uh, situations, but in a situation similar to that or that kind of situation, you, you're, you're right that returning to that same environment may not be the best option, but that does so doesn't mean that they, they need to be in the hospital. Uh, and so there, there starts to be the conversation uh, that's quite often trying to happen at two o'clock in the morning to try and find an alternate placement. Um, and I think that's, that's where some of the, the rubber meets the road is that you're right, going back to that same environment where this, this youth was incredibly frustrated. Uh, and if the, the screener, the qualified mental health professional has determined that this is a result of, you know, their, their development, their, their inability to manage their anger, their frustration, things of that sort, but not that they're, they're having, a, you know, uh, a psychiatric crisis per se uh, by, by those kind of definitions then yes, going back to that same environment is probably not the best option, but also doesn't necessarily mean that they also need to be in the hospital. And so that's, that's where the collaboration between our departments uh, uh, is, is an important piece to try and find that other alternative placement. Uh, I appreciate that. And then the other frustration added to that is the state's attorney says, why do I bother charging? Nothing will happen. Senator, uh, Representative Pugh, comment or question? Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Squirrel, you talked about the mobile crisis, that this is an, an initiative, and um, it may be unique to um, the Chittenden County area. Um, but the Community Mental Health Center there, uh, Howard, has something called First Call. And um, I believe that there was within the district office, and I, um, Commissioner Brown, um, a contract with, uh, um, with Howard as well to do intensive home visits to, in fact, address some of the what you are talking about and presenting as a needed intervention. And so I'm wondering, are these uh, unique to Chittenden County or um, sort of more, um, and you're trying to expand or you're trying a whole different model? Um, like, like Senator Sears, um, I, I, I cut my teeth in this world. And so um, it may be too long ago. Um, but at one point, I thought we were talking about no, 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 no wrong door, and um, that that children and youth who present ourselves are um, complex uh, com present are complex individuals with educational, emotional, and and um, family issues all and all wrapped up, um, and you have the role of uh, the Department of Mental Health. And then you have the role of DCF and the DCF family service workers. And when more than, you know, close to 300 times in the last year, family service workers who are not, um, not correctional officers, who are not things, people like that, were called out after hours to provide coverage because the child was, the youth was not hospital ready or there wasn't a bed or there wasn't transportation. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I, I get nervous when we hear, well, they're not hospital ready. Well, <clears throat> anyway, thank you. It, yeah, thank that, you. Uh, Representative Pugh, what was that number again? The number of call outs? Or... Um, 280. Um, <laughs> after hours and um, with, uh, you know, a mixture of things that they had to do, provide coverage um, because there was not a bed, provide 
um, coverage because transport wasn't happening, um, provide um, to, 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 um, to help staff at a hospital, you know, um, the screener. So for various different things. And that is, that sort of goes to your question maybe, um, or um, who, who, is, who is trained who is skilled to do some of these different things and who, who should be doing it? And is it a lack of resources, i.e. there's no, there are not enough beds? Is there a lack of people to transport um, that? Either Commissioner Brown or Commissioner Squirrel or Deputy Commissioner Morning Clock, any of these women. Yeah, I, I can just offer, uh, thank you, Representative Pugh. I really appreciate your <coughs> thoughtful comments um, and have so much respect for your experience in the system. Um, just going back to the mobile response piece and the crisis piece, uh, yes, the Howard Center um, was a real leader, you know, early on in terms of, you know, thinking about how do we respond earlier and proactively. We held some roundtable discussions um, about a year and a half ago exactly around this issue and you know what we heard from families coming to table to the table was yeah yes 10 years ago i could get more of that in home support and one of the things you'll see in the data that i can follow up with is we see this increased trend line um, in terms of need for emergency services for children and youth so i say that only to articulate that demand in that specific area has been increasing significantly um, in the past three years alone, uh, we have seen significant increases in children under nine um, who are accessing crisis services. Um, so again, it gets to the demand kind of outpacing resources, which is why we feel at this point, we really need to target resources around proactive intervention measures like mobile response um, that maybe haven't been scaled up or implemented as robustly across the state in an equitable way, uh, because we see that as a real opportunity um, and we do wanna get ahead of it. Um, so I guess, you know, that's just some, some thoughts related to mobile response and crisis response. And, you know, I can also assure you that our community mental health agencies and staff um, also working in 24 seven capacity across the state um, are doing everything that they can to try to triage these services and supports at the community level. Um, and also just wanna underscore that, you know, inpatient psychiatric hospitalization is a highest level, very restrictive level of care. Um, and we really wanna be putting our energy into, yes, if it's appropriate and then clinically indicated for that child or youth, we want them to access that care in a timely way. However, we also wanna be building out the community system to ensure, you know, would a crisis bed be appropriate? Would hospital diversion be appropriate? If we could have res responded to the family in a more proactive way, could we have avoided that need in the first place? So I, those are just a couple comments. Can I just make a comment? And then Monica Hunt, who is the commissioner of Dale has joined us and I, she may want to comment because of her new role um, in the administration. Um, she's just been I don't know if it's a promotion or a sideway or whatever, Monica, but um, how much of this uh, demand or um, stress on the system is due to substance abuse among the parents? When you talk about a tremendous increase in those under nine, and I'm wondering how much of this is due to the substance abuse amongst parents and kids growing up in increasingly dysfunctional families. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all as contributing Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Squirrels, Commissioner Hutt. Yeah, Anybody I would just, to? you know, I, I would just jump in here. Thank you, Senator, that, you, you know, we did see over the last five years an increase in our, in our caseload of kids coming into our care and custody. Um, and it did coincide, you know, with the, with the, the increase in the, in the opiate, you know, issues the state have been grappling with. And you know, in our review of the cases, um, definitely tied that increase to um, of kids coming in, in many certain cases, to opiate um, substance abuse addiction issues for the family. Um, you, you know, so, so there is a correlation there from, from, from the data that we have seen. 
um, that that definitely plays a role into kids coming into our system of care. Monica, is there a way of zeroing in on those families? Uh, so uh, certainly, uh, good morning, everybody. Monica Hutt, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. And as Senator Sears indicated, I'll be shifting roles in a week um, into the Prevention Chief um, Officer for the state of Vermont. So um, it's all... Uh, I'm not yet dug in at all, Senator. Um, I would certainly echo what, what Commissioner Brown said, having worked at DCF myself for a period of time and in community as well, certainly see the correlation with opiates. I think we also see and have always seen historically a correlation with substance use. So not only opiates, but you know, alcohol use is also a huge component of what um, the dynamics that stress families significantly and see kids coming into custody. So I've got to believe there is a way to, to target it and look at it more clearly and recognizing that the treatment for that is going to be a whole holistic family treatment. It will be supporting kids while we're supporting families um, and, and never able to get away from the social determinants that really contribute to that substance use and misuse. So it's a really big picture. Um, but I do think that while we're gathering that and thinking about that big picture, we're going to have to create some more targeted strategies a little bit more immediately because we can't wait on all of that to fall into place. I also just want to take the opportunity, if the committee doesn't mind, to um, just reframe really quickly. Selena Hickman is here joining me today on the committee. Um, she's actually uh, has changed her role. She was at DMH and we, we stole her away, um, as Commissioner Squirrel reminds me often. Um, to become the division director at the depart at the at the Department for um, Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. So Selena leads our developmental disabilities division. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that she was here and and um, able to contribute. Yeah, we we had the wrong title for her. We we had her still with DMH. Yes, I I, I will refute that always because we were very happy to have her join us. Great, um, the, which. One of the things that's um, kids are kids, but how much do you, in your current role, Dale, uh, Commissioner Squirrel, Commissioner Brown, how much do you coordinate the response in these families? Um, you know, and I, I don't have the Commissioner corrections here, but I know in a lot of cases, you have all four departments dealing with the same, members of the same family. Is there a coordination going on? Yeah, I, I, speaking from the uh, DCF's perspective, um, we have teams that meet regularly um, with uh, staff from Sarah Shop at the Departmental Health and uh, Department of Disabilities and Aging and Independent Living um, that, that uh, review individual cases and families and, and what are we seeing and, and what are the services they need and, and who takes the lead in providing that and making sure those ser those families are getting access to that those services. And then also when, um, you know, youth uh, begin to escalate for various reasons, those teams re reconnect um, to see what's the next appropriate step in placement for that youth. And, you know, in terms of is it, is it a residential program? Um, is it a mental health uh, uh, stabilization program? Um, you know, for youth, we are seeing an increase of youth on the autism spectrum and, um, uh, you know, and also are there other specialized programs that might meet that, that youth or family's needs? And so our teams do work together quite regularly to triage individual families and, and kids. Yeah, I would- Go ahead, no, go ahead. I was just gonna add to uh, what, Commissioner Brown articulated, um, and yes, at an interagency, you know, this agency level, there's an incredible amount of coordination happening. Um, and then at the community level, you know, just reflecting back to the work that I was doing in Lamoille in Caledonia County, I think I spent half of my time in the Morrisville DCF office at coordinated service plan meetings, you know, really triaging how do we meet the needs, who's going to do the case management and outreach with the family in our uh, school-based mental health meetings, you know, DCF always at the table with um, education, with mental health. Um, so that coordination is really intensive, both at the AHS level 
and at the community level. Um, and just going back to the comments about opioids, I was sitting with um, some educators virtually from Rutland and we were talking about, um, they had this, you know, kind of just complete wave of kindergartners and first graders presenting with such intensive need. And you could literally trace it back to five or six years earlier, um, the opioid kind of epidemic that they were focusing on, that they were experiencing in that community. So you can just see from a developmental standpoint on children, the impact that it is having across the state. Um, this might be a good segue. We've talked a little about transports and a little bit about charging. We have John Campbell, James Pepper, Sheriff Marku, and Sheriff Anderson. Um, do you all want to talk a little bit about both charging and um, as well as transporting kids? Because it, it may or may not be true. What, uh, what I hear is that it's really difficult to get a transport in off hours. Um, you know, it might not be that difficult at 9.30 in the morning, but at 9.30 at night, it's very difficult when a crisis occurs. So maybe the four of you can jump in or whatever you'd like. Senator, if, if the sheriffs could start with the transport, uh, the, you know, I think Sher Sheriff Mark, who can answer some of your questions. Uh, I, I would like, though, to, to get to the prosecution, prosecutorial, how these kids are being dealt with when there is a serious damage done or serious assaults. And that's Senator, that's why we, uh, we've asked uh, Diane Wheeler who uh, is handles uh, these cases up in Franklin County and has a uh, great experience uh, with that. And she is here um, and- uh, but, answer. But, also, but, I, but I should have asked Erica also, um, she, uh, you want, if you wanna just briefly consult with her because she's, she's frustrated by the situation and she has programs that residential programs in her county at Sea All and uh, Vermont School for Girls where some of these issues are arisen. If you'd like, I'll, I'll more, I'm more than happy to try to contact her while Sheriff Marcou or Sheriff Anderson speaking and then uh, see if she'd like to join. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. If she can't, maybe you can just Diane is, is able to uh, test okay. out a lot of this, so uh, I think that's. I thought, uh, she, I thought Jim Hughes was the prosecutor up there. Uh, Diane, Jim is the is the state's attorney. Diane is the deputy state's attorney, but she. Oh, had, okay. Was, yeah, All sorry. right. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. And uh, yeah, she handles all the these juvenile cases, and uh, she's handled some some major ones and ones that we're you know we were discussing. Okay. Um, last week, and that's why uh, we asked her to come on. Okay. Um, go ahead, Roger and, and yeah. Mark. Excuse I'll, me, uh, Sheriff Marku and Sheriff Anderson. All right. Thank you, Senator. I'll go yeah. first, and uh, Sheriff Anderson, uh, you can clean up like you usually do. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. Uh, since the um, since March of last year. Uh, our two departments particularly have been involved in, uh, you know, it, it's like we're an arm of the Agency of Human Services. Um, we have uh, at, at one time, uh, my department has had nine or 10 people working every night, overnight shifts uh, at the motels as Senator Sears mentioned. And that has put uh, a lot of strain. It, it's substantially less than that. Last night, we had a crew of four people. And then we had transports. And, and I'm not sure. We had two transports afternoon into the evening. And I'm not sure if they were DCF or mental health. I haven't seen the paperwork yet. But um, uh, so there is a tremendous amount of, um, of stress on us as well. We're losing people um, uh, and, and the... Uh, the police academy, because of COVID, hasn't had the capacity to to keep uh, recruits uh, um, in the pipeline for replacements, and we're working on that too as a uh, as a group. Um, some of the the additional stresses on top of the stresses we have is when we're asked to provide security for. Um, either DCF or mental health, or even even uh, we worked with Dale. Uh, on a particular uh, case. And uh, 
so that's in lieu of secure uh, a secure facility to keep these these kids or these individuals in, and uh, uh, and usually we've had a particularly this summer we had a couple of really tough tough cases, in which we required a couple of deputies, uh, and in one case we we had three deputies at a time, and that's not to uh, and that's so that they have the ability not to be restrained and to, to have free access of, of the, the, um, the, the, the house that they were in. Uh, but, um, you know, quite frankly, a lot of the individuals we deal with are very violent and, and um, you know, and, and have had a history that demonstrates that. So, so we're weighing that, um, um, you know, we're juggling that, that awareness that these are still juveniles, uh, juveniles with the fact that uh, um, we're responsible for their security and the safety of not only them, but the, um, uh, the staff that, that, you know, from, from either any one of the um, uh, de uh, departments that come and, and sit with them. So it's a, it's a tough, tough um, situation, but we, I think particularly Mark and I understand that we are partners, you know, and we are part of the solution uh you know we're the last people you want to have to call but uh when you need us you need us so uh for me uh one of the things that i am working with 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 the partners uh with um, dcf and i've, I've worked forever with with fox um, is uh not all of these individuals that we use as long as they are or have the proper training need to be certified police officers so that's one thing is that we're finding uh, uh, retired law enforcement officers that don't necessarily want to go back to the academy uh, for the for the what we call the level two, which is what used to be called the part time training. But these people have 30 years of experience. And quite frankly, um, the, the best tool that we have is our ability to talk and deescalate and, and uh, you know, all this stuff on our gun belt. Uh, we hardly ever use, we have to be trained and prepared, but we don't really ever use that stuff uh, in in, uh, in comparison to, to our ability to de-escalate. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, we will continue to, um, to try to recruit people and hire them. Uh, it is tough to get people uh, out of bed at two, three in the morning or on a Sunday afternoon or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's, that's agency heads, uh, that's our problem. It's our job to, to motivate folks to get out there when they're needed. But uh, I don't have a very big department, uh, but, uh, um, you know, we, we certainly, we, we answer the phone when, when people call us. So uh, Mark, I don't know, uh, Mark can, can speak to a plan. Uh, I believe he'll speak to a plan that we have to try to further uh, um, create an efficiency within our group to, um, uh, uh, to, to further help folks out that, that need it. Um, and I'm the Northern guy and he's the Southern person. So go ahead, Mark. But there's 14 of you. Right. And if, if they were all available, if they were all, um, up to staff and everything, this would be right. much easier. If they were all willing to do it, you too. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's it's not willingness, it's it's uh, the fact that they just don't have the capacity. So we can, I can control what I can control and, uh, I'm, and I'm on the team. Mark? Thank you for that, Roger. Uh, so uh, just to start, I know that uh, legislative committees enjoy uh, statistics, so, uh, in 2020, during COVID, my department saw a reduction of about 66% of requests for DCF transports. Why are we dealing with this problem now? Because we have just started seeing the return of DCF transports and the need for, for movement. Uh, now, is that uh, indicative of the entire state? I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that uh, we, back in 2011, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox and my department worked closely together after the flooding of Irene because we ran into a, uh, what I'm going to call a process and communication issue uh, between our department for the purpose of 
uh, secure transports for our people in mental health crisis that needed to get to um, uh, treatment settings, but were too violent to go by other means. The um, We are starting those conversations now. Uh, Sheriff Marcoux and I have worked with uh, Commissioner Brown's staff, uh, we have a, a plan in place uh, where effectively we're working to save the state money uh, in terms of uh, what is um, delivered for this service, but also to make sure that it is getting the service as quickly as possible. What was happening before is that uh, uh, what I'll call the origin county and the destination county uh, were contacted. And then if those agencies were not able to provide the transport, then uh, follow on in successive counties would be contacted. The difficulty with this is, is simply the human issue. When you call someone at two in the morning, uh, similar to if you received a call at two in the morning, what are things that could happen? People fall back asleep without following up on phone calls. Uh, people are uh, trying to wake up other people who are asleep. Uh, some people are currently working in other capacities and they're able to do the work, but they're not able to do the work for maybe 30 minutes, 60 minutes. 90 minutes, whatever that may be. And so through that, we're talking about a child who's sitting in a, a police department in a, a residential a treatment center uh, in a, a, a juvenile uh, facility, and they are looking for movement, and this is time that is ticking. So the plan that we're uh, working on creating is essentially streamlining the line of communication and expediting the access to uh, personnel uh, through means that already exist. Uh, I've offered my dispatch, which is a 24 hour dispatch that has all the resources that uh, remote workers currently do not have at their homes uh, to be able to facilitate some of this communication to ensure that the sheriffs uh, receive the documents that they need, uh, as well as ensure that DCF is getting a, a team of deputies or uh, civilian staff uh, to respond as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Uh, I don't wanna to talk about the uh, specific incidents, uh, but I, I do want to bring light to one. I had uh, 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 actually two. I had a deputy who, or two deputies who were providing transport for Department of Mental Health uh, about two weeks ago. And uh, at the same time, we received a similar request for DCF. One was from St. Albans, one was from uh, Bennington. We, uh, we wanted to do the Bennington one first because that was the closest but the child was not prepared to go. And so in that case, the St. Albans person was, we now have a five hour turnaround, six hour turnaround to be able to make that move before we come back. Uh, we had another instance uh, where uh, we had, uh, and Sheriff Marku and I were working on this, uh, we had a person who was ready to go and there's just a mix up about the authorization to move the person. And so when I say that some of these are communication issues, it's sometimes it's the bureaucracy and the red tape that, uh, that ties up these issues and it's uh, getting the right people into the right room to have the conversation. So working with Commissioner Brown's staff, uh, we have uh, we have this plan in place. We are uh, just now I received uh, the documents that we were waiting for to uh, finalize and be able to start training my staff to pick up the ball on this. Uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that we are able to, to, to deliver to the point of uh, to the point of staffing, uh, we've testified about this in Senate government operations. Uh, there's an issue about uh, what we call poaching officers. Um, currently recruiting efforts are targeted at other law enforcement agencies. I just lost two officers within the last month uh, to another agency who was hiring. And so it's uh, it can be incredibly difficult, especially when uh, there's a, uh, I guess what I'll say is a, a culture change uh, that uh, law enforcement is looking at nationally uh, in recruiting. Uh, and so we are working through those issues. I have uh, several applicants that are in the process, but as COVID also puts limitations on capacity at the academy, we're also working on strategies to deliver uh, training in alternate ways. So you have a transport to Bennington from St. Albans or a, and a transport from St. Albans to Bennington. Um, <clears throat> So uh, in that instance, no, Senator, it was a transport from St. Albans to Brattleboro and a transport from Brattleboro to Bennington. Oh, okay. And so it was, uh, that was a Sunday afternoon and we attempted to contact uh, a variety of people, but on short notice, sometimes uh, in an area with sparse communication efforts, cell phone coverage, uh, it can be hard to get someone, uh, you get a voicemail, you get a voicemail. 
so we do work to, to access our, our staff. We have an incredibly responsive and, and active staff. Um, the, uh, we have uh, a willingness to work. Uh, and one of the reasons that Sheriff Marku and I are, uh, are partners in this, we're the two uh, highest delivering agencies for the Agency of Human Services. We actually just ran the report. So we, we enjoy uh, doing this. We have staffs that are committed to doing this. And we're also, uh, we're two departments that are proactive uh, and creative in uh, identifying ways that we uh, create the least uh, trauma, the least impact on, on used people with mental health. We started delivering uh, or utilizing no restraints or soft restraints instead of the, the traditional metal restraints. We started uh, training before training was mandated uh, on how to deal with people involved with trauma, trauma-informed policing, uh, trauma-informed uh, education even. Uh, so we've done a lot of work in a lot of creative ways to help ensure that these populations who, uh, they're not criminal, but we have tools uh, to take, uh, uh, to ensure their safety uh, in violent settings. I'd like to, you know, in the immediate future, see if we could set up a meeting with you and myself and Sheriff Marku and John Campbell and Senator White from government operations to talk about some of these issues. Is that something either in the budget or in a bill on transporting um, folks? Um, John, do you have, um, is Diane Wheeler here? Yes, Diane is here. And um, also, Eric, I just got uh, oh, finished. Oh, fantastic. So, Erica, Eric is not on yet. I don't, I don't believe okay. well, she'll be coming on, but Diane is here and she'll be able to give you some, um, some, uh, you know, ideas of what's happening up in the northern counties. Yeah. Um, but you see, Experience. I guess I'm specifically also looking at, well, I'll wait for Erica to ask that question. She's a little bit principal to me, my opinion. Um, Diane, go ahead. welcome to the Senate Judiciary uh, and House Human Services. Thank you um, very much. And um, I sent you a message that was meant for uh, Representative Whitman. But, um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, good you morning. You can ignore all. the message. I shall do so. I just wanted to note that the St. Albans District really highlights a great number of the issues that are presenting themselves before these committees. And very specifically, what I'm noting is that we have a mental health crisis among some of our juveniles, which result oftentimes in delinquent behavior. And Senator, you've asked what happens in those circumstances if they're in a foster home or some placement, even an alternative school uh, program where they commit um, or engage in behaviors that would be considered delinquencies, such as unlawful mischief, uh, assaults, domestic assaults, aggravated domestic assaults. And the answer is not a satisfactory one because the answer is it depends. It depends on the student's mental health their cognitive abilities, whether or not we can impart a prompt response to their behaviors, or do we have to cite them out if we're going to give them a citation and bring them in as a delinquent, um, you know, six to eight weeks, which is the typical time between an event and a juvenile coming to court. So what we have done up here in Franklin County is looked at the crime, looked at the reason behind it, and assessed whether or not that crime or that delinquency is one that um, causes harm to the juvenile or others. Does the community need protections? Do we need conditions of release in the juvenile court to protect an individual or a group of individuals? Specifically, let's say if it's a lewd and lascivious conduct at a school or a program, do we need to protect the members of that program, that school? So based on the answers to those questions, we make decisions about charging the juvenile as a delinquent. What we do lack is prompt response, as I've indicated, but sometimes um, with persons who might not have a mental health issue, but are just violent in the community, we have a bigger problem because we don't have a place for those juveniles to go. Our system is 
has mental health services. And Representative Pugh has pointed out the great resource in Chittenden County. Um, I know a number of people down there have utilized it. Franklin, we do not. Um, but there are residential beds. There are stabilization beds throughout the state for these juveniles. But what about that juvenile who is acting out, putting a leg of a chair through his mother's head? Doesn't have a mental health problem, but is violent and engaging in those behaviors. It's difficult for DCF to place those persons, that juvenile, in a foster home. It really doesn't need the mental health issues. Sometimes there's no drug or substance issue as well. So that's why as I listened to the um, hearings concerning even the new bed and uh, placement in Wa uh, Newberry, excuse me, I have to wonder two things. Can that serve the violent community unsafe juvenile? And how do we address females? Because Newberry is taking males only. And I can let this committee know that we have had a DCF worker assaulted in the head, punched in the head by a female juvenile in DCF custody. And that DCF worker suffered some injuries as a result of that. Now at the time, that juvenile female was able to go to DCF, uh, excuse me, go to Woodside. But without that, where are, we, where are these teens going? Well, the answer is currently hotels and St. Albans Police Department, at least in Franklin County. And that is not safe for any of them, for the law enforcement, for DCF, and for the juvenile themselves. The children who do have mental health issues who get screened, because we do have an embedded mental health worker with state police, which has been an incredible help. And if the uh, juvenile gets screened and is screened for Brattleboro, we have had circumstances up here in the last 30 to 60 days where a juvenile has sat at the emergency department for overnight or for a number of days, often staffed by DCF persons until a bed is available down at Brattleboro. Often what happens is, or what has occurred in those circumstances is the juvenile's emergency, his, the crisis, dissipates over that time. So by the time a bed is available at Brattleboro, they they're no longer in crisis. So they get transported to Brattleboro and quickly turn around and come back to our community. That is not a satisfactory response for anyone because the issues for that juvenile are still present but they have not been addressed because of the time between crisis and transport. Now, there are at times when um, juveniles, Senator you had, Sears, you had asked, are being brought into the DCF system and mental health system um, as a way to address their mental health situations. And it is akin to what we've done with law enforcement over the years. And that is the parent might have been trying to get services for the child, they haven't worked. The child is still um, engaging in harming behavior, harmful to others. So it ends up that that juvenile comes into custody because the um, DCF is able to get services in place much quicker than they can in the basic community. Uh, uh, can I just, uh, just before we go too far, um, I'm trying to understand if you're suggesting the need for more secure settings. Or do you uh, Your Honor, uh, excuse me, Senator, in my um, work for over 25 years here in Franklin County in the juvenile systems, I also do uh, the major child abuse cases. We do need a, actually a replacement for Woodside, a detention center. We have treatment placements. We do not have a place for the violent juvenile. And that is something, and we have um, one, two, 
two or three persons right now that could utilize that type of facility. And again, it needs to have the ability to take females. Well, uh, you know, my, maybe Commissioner Brown can refresh my memory, but I do want to get on to um, State Attorney Martha too. She's been kind enough to join us. Um, but um, you've opened up a whole slew of questions. So. Uh, I, as, as I indicated, Senator, the we do charge some juveniles who engage in delinquent behavior while in DCF custody, while at at least um, alternative school programs or programs here in Franklin County. That's a, that's a good segue to um, Erica Math that you, um, whatever reason, Bennington has both the Bennington School for Girls operated by Beckett and the See All okay. Inc. programs. Um, Erica, maybe you could comment on this. Um, the, the, and I appreciate you coming at short notice to join us, but the real question, and you and I have had conversations about this, is regarding charging juveniles who either assault staff or do tremendous damage. And maybe you and Diane can join in that conversation, but um, many times the police don't want to charge and you don't want to charge. And could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so with both of those programs um, in the community, there's uh, always, usually once a week, we'll have uh, one of those programs will be, it'll get to the issue where the police and DCF are not able to kind of work out what's going to happen to this uh, individual on their own. And then um, that's when they call uh, the state's attorney. So you know, we've done a number of things. Um, Beth Sawsville, I don't know if you've had any if her name's come up, but she's the district director for um, DCF currently. Her name always comes up when I talk to yeah. Mr. Brown. He's always moving her out of Bennington to some other post. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she, we talked uh, a couple of years ago about the idea <clears throat> that I was really struggling with 204, 206 houses uh, violent kids like there are juveniles there that that that's why they're there um same with vermont school for girls so when we have those calls come in i'm pretty careful about uh communicating with the um the police agency the placement agency so whether it be vermont dcf or if it's uh, a kid vermont school for girl has girls has a number of uh juveniles placed there from out of state um we kind of problem solve as a group before we make decisions to uh, remove um, anyone from the program or even charge them with a delinquency. I've utilized CRJ uh, for probably the last year and a half. Um, when we have the police respond to one of the uh, residential placements in Bennington, if it's something where I have the director saying, the director of the program saying, yeah, we could be okay with this person staying here. Um, and unfortunately, we just had some change in personnel there. So I haven't had the opportunity to talk to uh, Jim Henry yet about this. I see he's on the call though. But they, Letha will take, will CRJ will intervene. And most of the cases, uh, that's how they resolve. So if it's a, a juvenile that has an outburst while they're, um, trying to restrain or, uh, you know, it's interesting to me because some of them come in as the kid that doesn't, you know, he has an outburst when he's told to go back to his room because he didn't ask permission for something. And, you know, I struggle with those because I'm like, you know, well, yeah, that's not unexpected, right? I mean, <laughs> there are kids that, um, that are there that have these types of issues. I think, we've done a good job being able to, I very rarely are filing delinquencies on cases that uh, where the kid is placed in a residential placement in Bennington. Where we run into problems is, uh, as Diane was indicating, the there are some that are super violent. Um, you know, I don't know if, Senator, you remember, you know, 10 years ago, we had a teacher that lost an eye at Bennington School uh, when it was still Bennington School because a uh, juvenile um, put a pencil into her eye. And so stuff like that. Uh, we also had the case at 
Bennington school with the boy that, um, that seriously almost beat the woman to death with a dumbbell and, but for the other residents that, um, they wouldn't, he would have succeeded. So those are the cases that we don't have a place for those kids. Um, those juveniles, uh, on a short term temporary, uh, this is an emergency situation. Uh, that said, I'm always concerned that, um, you know, Diane and I have been doing this an, an awful lot of years. And so we're not sometimes as quick to, uh, respond with this kid needs a resident, you know, a high scale secure placement. We're a little, uh, we think about it a little more because we've been doing it for so long. But, you know, when you have counties where that's just not happening um, or that there's kind of this general uh, aura around the whole juvenile world where people, you know, new, new attorneys in particular and new police officers get panicked dealing with juveniles because they're not Sure. I mean, um, I see Marshall's on the call. We've had, I mean, there's a lot of areas where it's like people are, um, it's a very complicated area of the law. So uh, yesterday, I think, it, no, uh, Wednesday morning, we had our um, juvenile justice stakeholders conversation. And I was uh, thinking, just kind of thinking outside the box about this issue. And I thought, why couldn't we have um, some secure beds and, and rather than support secure beds for year round when we may or may not need them, is there a way for us to hire essentially contractors that their job is to have a juvenile for a short period of time in more of a residential placement, we've talked about how you can't just put kids like this in a violent or a violent um, juvenile into a regular foster home. But I talked about life management, and I know Senator, you hear me talk about this all the time. But you know, I'm not saying we put a bunch of the you know violent juveniles living in the same house together. But that model where we brought the DOC worker to the um, residence. You know, I just wonder if that's maybe not an option because that would address the female population and the male population. So now we don't have to have uh, on the rare instance that this happens, we don't have I mean, and I say rare, it happens probably a dozen times a year. We don't we don't. And not just for me, I'm thinking for the southern half of the state, we we would have a, a person that is specifically trained. Uh, you know, and maybe they're in pairs, maybe it's two people that are essentially charged with caring, you know, and I don't want to say containing, but making sure this juvenile is safe and not in a police station and not in a hotel and not at the hospital until we can figure out what the longer term solution is. I think I did understand the the idea behind, you know, not maintaining uh, Woodside for you know, because it got a little bit of a mixed purpose, right? We were trying to use some of the beds for treatment and some of the beds for detention. And, and we were maintaining this, you know, whole facility with all these folks. And I talked a lot with Beth about it because, of course, she was there right at the as they were closing. Um, and so anyway, those are my thoughts. I think there are a lot of ways to kind of think outside the box and try to come up with creative solutions. Yeah. What I well, don't think we're going to do, we're not going to make this population go away. We need to have something that is a temporary, safe, secure placement for those youth that we just have no place for. I didn't mean to shut Diane Wheeler off, um, but you sound to be both in agreement on the need. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't catch the beginning of Diane's um presentation. I mean, I don't, we don't see it come up a super amount. And like I said, we're doing quite a bit to, cause we have the two facilities. We're really trying oh. to do more to divert people. <laughs> you know, I don't want to charge someone who's in custody of DCF for being an unmanageable with then being unmanageable in their program. <laughs> like that just, so it has to really rise to a, another level. Maybe I could ask commissioner Brown if the contract was um, Sununu Center in uh, New Hampshire 
would allow short-term placement? Yes, our, our contract is open-ended in terms of how long we place a youth there. Um, so it, there's not a time limit, whether it's for a week or, or seven weeks or, or seven months. Um, our contract so, it, it has flexibility. So the kid that Diane Wheeler identified and Eric has spoken about could potentially go to the Sununa? Yes, and you know, and our team internally is working on the referral protocol um, to, to make sure that there's a process for state's attorneys to be aware of, of how we can refer youth um, and receive um, court approval to, to put a youth there, just as they would in, in Woodside. But um, so we are, are close to finalizing that, and that should be rolled out to the state's attorneys um, pretty soon, just so they're aware of how our internal mechanism to coordinate with uh, the SUNY new program and the local team to make sure that that, that process is seamless and can move as quickly as possible. Diane, did you, you wanted to comment on that or Eric, both of you? Or? Yes, I did, Senator. The one concern that the state has and um, is that in order to send a child out of the state of Vermont without a parent and a child's agreement specifically is you need a court order. So you need a court hearing so that the 2 a.m. Um, incident where a law enforcement gets called to a serious domestic assault or sex assault, uh, those situations are not going to allow that, that juvenile to be sent out of state to Sununu that night. They need a hearing before that can happen. So yep. the question is for that short term, as Erica said, where do they go? Well, I put my hat on as a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and say that um, one of the reasons for the closure of Woodside was a $6 million bill for one to two kids. And yes, it was. And, but keep in mind, Senator, that also during that time... But what so don't we spend if we if we spend that $6 million in general? Well, um, I didn't hear the last part you you. What don't we fund if we spend six million dollars for two kids in a generally, you know, Woodside type setting? Well, the two the two kids that were there, and I my, one of mine was, I had one there myself at that time. Is the law had changed where the judge um, could only send a, a juvenile to Woodside with DCF's permission and acquiescence, and that's what changed the numbers at Woodside is that the state's attorney, the judge couldn't send them. So while to answer the question- well, You haven't are, answered my question about know, what I, you do with the $6 million and what, do you, what don't you spend on if you take that 6 million and put it somewhere else? Uh, um, my understanding is that Newberry's cost is about 5 million, is that correct? Um, I don't know. And no, I don't it, think it, no, we, I don't think so. We anticipate it, it's it's less than that. Um, I think it's two and a half million, isn't it? The three million budgeted correct. for it. two yeah. and a half to yeah. three million. Yeah. So um if I could uh, just jump in here, I, I would say that uh, both uh, Deputy State's Attorney Wheeler and uh, State's Attorney Marthridge, uh, you know, have brought up some some very important points. Um, and specifically to the points that Erica um uh, brought up in some of her, her outside of the box suggestions. You know, those are the conversations we're having internally. You know, we recognize that certainly there's always areas to improve and provide a better service to some of our youth with more challenging behaviors. And so we're actually having those similar conversations and working to um, in line with the suggestion she made about, is there um, a, a short-term setting that we can create in state uh, with a high level of expertise, um, you know, that's very short term for youth with really aggressive behaviors, you know, where we have specialized contractors, you know, working with those youth until a longer term plan, how to serve that youth in a more long term manner uh, can be developed. And, you know, we recognize there's improvements to be made in the system. I think, uh, Diane, uh, what, actually what you were adding up there was the, the, the operating costs will be about two and a half to three million. There is a two million something uh, line item that would go to the construction uh, to help rebuild the facility. That's a one-time expense. Uh, and I appreciate, Senator, uh, Commissioner Brown's statements. 
And uh, I just, it's very passionate that it's the emergencies that are, that are um, having kids spend time in the police departments at the emergency room. And, you know, even the youthful offenders, the kids that are over 18 that go to juvenile court on, um, you know, misdemeanor crimes. You know, I hate to see a transient kid out there in the cold. Um, we can't, we can't arrest them. We can't bring them into DCF custody for services. So there's even another group that needs well, um, help. At this point, I'd rather, um, uh, I thank you. Thank uh, you, well, Senator. Erica, thank you for the short, um, and uh, if you can stay on, you're both welcome to. And did you have any further comments, Erica? I, just quickly, I wondered if <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Brown could, what I was thinking when I suggested that as well was that there would be some type of um, referral group or service or the problem that we ran into with uh, when, as Diane indicated, judges went had to had to be the ones to order um, to Woodside. They're still <coughs> only getting the information in a vacuum, right? Like they're getting what I know, they're getting what the police know, they're getting what a particular DCF person knows, but they're, we're still not getting the full picture. And so sometimes I just want to make sure if DCF is looking at alternatives in secure type settings, you know, can we a get how many how many kids a year are we talking about that were sent? And then b were they all similarly situated? Were they all kids that needed to be ordered to Woodside, or was it just a situation where we kind of threw up our hands at two in the morning and said, well, Woodside? And so you know if if I could just throw that out there for Commissioner Brown, and I'm more than happy to talk about this at all. Uh, like I said, um, I see a few folks from the Juvenile Justice Stakeholders Committee that are on this, and we're having this conversation as to the older population, but I think it would be really useful for the younger population as well. Yeah, I'm happy to meet offline with you, Erica, and kind of continue this conversation. I think it's valuable. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna um, shift here a little bit uh, uh, Jim Henry and, and Jeff Karen are here from the um, from Beckett and Seal. But I wanted to ask Jim a question. I I visited 119 River Street where there is a, is it a gap or horizon? I can't, are both there. One of them is just for one person. And I'm wondering if that isn't something about what Erica is talking about at, at uh, 119 River Street in Bennington. Yeah, our our horizon program is a one bed. Okay. I got the wrong. Yeah, got, it's not gap. It's horizon. Right. Um, and that's one. Can you um, talk a little bit about problems that you're seeing? You're the one that um, gave us the information last week about the increase in workers' comp, sharp increase in the in your rates because of injuries to staff. Yeah. So we. Basically, we just kind of went through our um, audit with uh, workers' comp. Um, our workers comp went up thirty eight thousand dollars this year um, to a total of uh, approximately one hundred and seventeen thousand um, based on uh, injuries, you know obviously with by the way, this is at a time when we just heard yesterday in Senate appropriations about the tremendous decrease in workers' comp rates around the state. Yeah. Yeah, not, not with us. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we have had a fair amount of injuries through uh, the restraints. Um, we have a couple people out right now um, from uh, restraint, being injured in restraints, uh, significant injuries. Um, so that, yeah, that's definitely something that, uh, that has come into play. Um, but I do want to throw out there, though, although we have experienced staff getting hurt through the injuries, not a single youth has been hurt through any of our restraints. Jim, um, when you're when you have a kid who's acting out and destroys furniture or assaults a staff member, what um, um, you what is it when you take them to the hospital? What happens? Um, well, for mental health is not for injury. Um, it kind of depends in a sense that first off, it depends on what the, what the youth is, you know, labeled at. 
if they are an adjudicated delinquent, that opens up the possibility for the secure placement with Sununu or you know previously Woodstock. But if they're not an adjudicated individual, that really limits where they can go. Um, some of the some of the situations have been where the youth has gone up there to the to EC, ECA, the emergency crisis unit has been screened and has been returned, you know, over a period of time, might be a couple hours, might even be a day or so, um, based on no beds, you know, in Brattleboro. Um, other times, uh, I think I, I can think of a couple times where we may have switched out an individual through the uh, Turtle Rock, uh, yeah, Turtle Rock program, where um, the individual they may have had there, you know, we would switch, take the person out and, you know, go with a uh, change of scenery type possibility to see if that would work with the individuals. Um, but it is limited um, what we can do with the, with the individuals who are, you know, acting out in that manner. Can you speak to some of the staff injuries? Um, let's see. So probably the most significant one right now is a knee where um, the staff member was kicked um, but on the side of the knee, um, so she, that's, that's probably our most expensive workers' comp um, injury right now. Um, some of it would be, you know, trips to the ER based on being punched um, or, you know, getting checked out um, from knee injuries or something else along the, you know, through the restraint process. Um, let's see, we got a couple of wrists, a couple of fingers. Um, but yeah, mostly the, the knee is the biggest, the biggest one that stands out the most significant, most costly to us right now. Before COVID, I dropped into 204 and I was amazed at the lack of furniture. Um, and you, what some do you of, do? Well, well, some of it is, um, in a sense, trying to space, space the kids out a little bit. You know, we had the, the couches in there. I think we had three couches in the, you know, 204. Um, and then as some of them got damaged, instead of replacing them, we looked to go to more individualized chairs um, to kind of keep a more of a separation, you know, amongst the, the, the individuals. A lot of damage, a lot of, a lot of damage to the buildings. Yep. Yeah, we just had a, a an incident where a youth um, did some significant damage to 204, enough that we kind of had to close that that down. COVID also kind of played a little bit into that with some staffing issues, but we basically had to move the individuals out of the 204 building into 206 so that we could fix you know, doors and locks and th things along those lines, uh, TV, um, and then move them back into the building. Do you have a problem with kids that stay much longer than would be in a usual temporary setting? Um, there are a few um, of the residents who, you know, have hit, have been with us for a longer period of time. Um, definitely can get bored, can get stale in a sense. Um, but I do know the struggles of the placements and, uh, you know, where these individuals um, can go to, um, which, you know, some of them are going out of state, which, you know, going through the court process that was mentioned earlier, um, can delay. So, you know, so we do hold on to the, the individuals in that sense. Um, but yeah, we, our typical uh, length of stay is 30 days and it's a little higher for the girls. Um, but, but there have been a handful um, where we've had them for, you know, a couple months. State Attorney Wheeler said that there's no place for violent girls. Um, I think we're pretty much it. Um, you know, in that sense. And our numbers for the GAP program, the, our girls program has been pretty high. You know, it's five beds. Um, but, um, you know, as far as I see it, I see it that we are kind of the, the woodside for girls currently. Um, and that and that has been, you know, fairly full over the last, you know, last year or so. Jeff, over at Beckett, you have girls, right? Um, in Bennington. Can you talked a little bit about some of the issues you're having if any with the i know you have kids from all over the um not just from vermont but other states specifically to vermont kids are problems that you're encountering 
I'll allow uh, Lorraine Baker. Uh, she's our executive director of uh, our Vermont School for Girls. <coughs> she she uh, can uh, answer your question. Good. Senator. Well, great. Um, I don't see her in my screen. Hi. 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 Yeah, right there now. you are. Um, oh, thanks nice for the opportunity. You. Thank you. Yeah, so we certainly have girls who, as a result of their traumatic experiences, have aggressive adaptations, as Erica well knows. Um, it's, it's not our practice to accept girls with a um, history of aggression that's significant, particularly as it relates to assaultive behavior toward others. Um, it would be contraindicated in a, in a facility such as ours who meets the needs of survivors of trauma. Um, and unfortunately, there, there are times when this is the case. And, um, you know, I've said, I've talked to um, others about this in the past, when, when one of our girls is, is out of her window of tolerance and, and in a dissociative process, she can be just as violent and just as dangerous as, as any boy. We had a gal two summers ago um, who was probably 5'11", um, well north of 200 pounds, who became violent in our school building and, and the local police helped out, thank goodness, um, quickly so no one was hurt and she was able to go to Woodside. And the last girl we had who went to Woodside um, assaulted our residential director who's extremely um, strong in de-escalation strategies, but you know, relatively significantly, um, he didn't need care or anything. But you know, I, I would say that when our girls do act out in these ways, and I hesitate to say it without knocking on wood, we, we haven't had a significant one um, for about 17 months, um, but who's counting? You know, it's, it's just as, as scary, just as violent as what can happen with the boys. And, um, you know, unlike Jim's program and, you know, thank goodness they're able to do it. It's, you know, it's not, it's not our practice to do that. We did establish two years ago uh, an ERT program that allows us to meet the needs of, of students who have a, a need for a um, higher staffing ratio, their acuity is much higher. So we're able to meet the needs of students with significant and profound histories of self-harming behavior and suicidality. But the you know, the violence is always the place, whether it's at the Vermont School for Girls or the New England School for Girls, where we hit the pause button and have to ask ourselves if it's going to be safe for our students and our staff. However, when you treat children and adolescents with uh, complex PTSD, you always have to allow for, for that ad adaptation. And Erica has been tremendously supportive. Um, and you know the restorative justice program here in Bennington, um, it, it really helps us tease out what girls really need another consequence because we do try to keep it in in a model that's consistent with restorative justice. Because as she said, you know we don't want kids who are here for those challenges to just pick up more charges because it further complicates everything so have you seen an increase in workers comp rates similar to CL? no i mean we our last claim was substantive to say the least um biggest one since i've been around was last not last september but so it's september 2019 right jeff yeah that would have been the the last one so it's um you know, not our experience, but we have a, a practice where we debrief after any um, situation where a staff person has any level of, of harm. And we certainly have had in the past three months, a few of those. And, you know, we, we make our, our youth and our staff aware that at any time they, 
absolutely can press charges. I work very closely with um, Cam Grandy as well locally because I think consequences are important. I, um, it's critical for our girls to understand the impact of their behavior. So again, I wanna knock on wood, not Cam, an increase, but a substantial one 15 months ago. Cam Grandy is the Lieutenant of the Bennington Police Department. Other, um, anybody questions for either Jim Henry or Laura or Jeff? Like really appreciate your being here. Give, uh, oh, are restraints up or down? Well, we we look at our data every every week. We have a data review meeting, and uh, again, knock on wood, happily down this month and uh, substantively over the past the past year. And and when we examine our our patterns of restraints, um, we find that you know, the, the data doesn't lie. And, and what we find is that it tends to be the, the same youth. So when we, when we disaggregate that piece, it can be really helpful to, to look at the trends. And we look at trends across days, across times of day. Um, it's, it's always worse at transitions, you know. So, um, you know, knock, knock, down. I think, um... And Jim testified last week or maybe at another point that um, the majority, a tremendous majority, were the same one or two kids who were restrained rather than the entirety of the population. Is that still true, Jim? Yeah. Um, well, to your first question, our restraints are up um, a, a significant amount over last year. Um, but yes, I, to your second question there, your point, I think it was like 65% of the restraints that we had, um, 13 residents made up those 65 restraints. And what percent of those res of the yearly? Oh, wait, 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 did I say that right? 65 percent of those restraints were made up of 13 individuals. Um. I'm going to get to Marshall Paul in a minute, but Steve Howard has been writing things down and um, chopping at the bit, and I can see him um, uh, in my window. So Steve represents the VSEA and uh, wanted to share some of the VSEA's concerns. Uh, thank you, Senator. And, and I will just say that, um, as I think everybody can agree, I'm a very poor substitute for our very able members and who work for DCF. Uh, but I will let you know those who are able are watching you on YouTube and uh, are texting me and have uh, taken the time to answer the questions that you um, provided to the committee. So I'm gonna do my best to translate um, and provide you very briefly what some of the feedback from the folks on the front lines of the Department of Children and Families and in Family Services. I want to just start by saying that I, um, I'm sorry to hear about what's happening with the workers' comp claims at 204 and 207. Hope I have those numbers right. Six. Uh, 206, sorry. I get lost any, very easily. Um, it's not different from what our members at Woodside experienced. Um, and, and yet it still, I think, says a lot about whether you work for DCF or you work for, for uh, one of the depot programs or for Woodside you are often asked to put your physical health, your mental health and your, and, um, your life in danger to serve these, these youth, uh, which they do willingly. Uh, I just wanna go through just quickly uh, a couple of things that our members wanted to say. First of all, I think um, our members wanna associate themselves very much with what Diane Wheeler had to say, and also with, uh, with uh, Erica Marthage. Um, during uh, Diane's testimony, I got many uh, text messages applauding what she had to say and the need for a secure facility. Um, and I think clearly there is a trickle down effect of in the system and the lack of beds in the system and the lack of community resources uh, that, have, that has been exacerbated by the closing of Woodside. Um, there are a couple of points that they wanted to make on the mental health front. Um, they're saying to me that it's very challenging to get a mental health screening uh, that the, the um, mental health service agencies um, don't often have on-site crisis support. 
and will disagree and argue with the social worker about whether the issue that the child is presenting is behavioral or mental health in nature. And that is very a source of great frustration for the, for the family service worker who is there with the child and, and watching and seeing the behavior and understands that it's a mental health problem, but they're being told that it's not uh, by the mental health agency that's charged with providing mental health services. Um, they are very concerned about foster parents. You know, if hospitalization is not approved or doesn't, they don't meet, the child doesn't meet the criteria, uh, foster parents are given a safety plan and often the foster parents who are now are the backbone of what DCF is, I think, trying to build as an alternative, um, have a very low threshold for what behaviors they're willing to accept in their home. Um, and they often refuse. And when they do, it leaves the family services worker with um, the responsibility for picking up the pieces. Um, and that's when they end up in police stations and hotel rooms, uh, in parking lots, in, in the DCF offices, watching, ki watching kids. Um, they're also very concerned about um, the situation that occurs when, ch when children do go to the hospital, that once, once they get to the hospital, there, there are many uh, stories of children who were, as they would describe it, warehoused in the ERs, um, and describe, they describe that as five days, sometimes as high as 180 days in ERs, uh, waiting for beds in the system. Um, they really believe very strongly that if we are going to rely on foster parents, that we have to have more skills and more resources for the foster parents. And in one of the things that is strongly stressed, especially in the northwestern part of the state, uh, you're very blessed, I think, to have the depot programs in, in Bennington. And, um, and there are resources for er that Erica and the folks down there have that in the northwest, they just don't exist. Um, and so they, our members would ask the committee to look at what services are provided, particularly in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, one of the programs that used to exist is something called the High Fidelity RAP program uh, that is no longer available up in that area that provides intensive services to, family, to families who are willing to open their homes to these youth. Um, transports are a problem. There's no doubt about it. And one of the points that our, our members are making is that the length of the transport is often an issue. Uh, and so if you are able to create resources there, you know, that are closer to home, like in the Northwestern part of the state, uh, some, of those, some of the transport issues may be addressed. But what they reported to me when they uh, answered your question is that it's incredibly difficult to find sheriffs to transport during the day and at night that uh, they can they can call every transporter in the entire state at least once and probably again. Um, and again, due to the lack of uh, programs in the northern part of the state, the transport is almost always to Bennington. Um, they have some other resources for transportation, but they say that, that they're not appropriate for some of the high, um, they're not secure transports for some of the high risk youth. Um, so those are just some, on those two issues, I think what one of the things that they want to stress is there just aren't enough beds, there's not enough community resources. Um, and, and I think they would say, um, read again what Diane Wheeler had to say um, and, con and considering uh, what's lacking in the system. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, Representative Pugh, did you have a comment? I've been told. Did you have a question for Steve? Or would you? No. Okay. You're muted. Um, I just, um, I wanted to thank Steve and um, I had the pleasure of uh, listening to um, probably close to 70 um, employees last night. And that was what I heard. Um, what I, what uh, it's perhaps not specifically to Steve and I had to step out of the meeting oh. um, brief, briefly um, before. Um, as people talk about, um, and some of the, um, I think it was Jim and then Eric or some, we're talking about, uh, they no longer, there was, that, that Woodside was the stop 
would say was the, was the backstop. Um, it was perhaps my erroneous um, perspective that for youth to go to Woodside, they had to be delinquent and that not all youth who become aggressive and um, out of control, in fact, are delinquent, but in fact, got into placement because of trauma, because of um, other kinds of situations. So um, I guess for me, maybe to, to, to focus solely on, do we need a Woodside? I need to be, I, I need, I think we need clarity is do we, do we need a place for juveniles who um, are aggressive and, or do we need um, the capacity for um, children and youth who come into um, the state's responsibility, but not as delinquents? I think actually, Kind of hit the nail on the head, Representative. Do you agree with you? I think the question isn't not whether we need Woodside and I, that, that's gone. Um, right. uh, there's no point in going right. over it. The question is how can we better coordinate the services for these kids to better protect um, the communities than obviously the folks that deal with it? I'm you know, this transport issue is not, I wouldn't dismiss that at all. And how do we get that kid from the foster home, let's say, or the emergency room or wherever it is to the appropriate place? And it may be that uh, the Department of Children and Families, Department of Mental Health, and even the Department of Corrections all within the agency human services better court have need better coordination to get where we need to get um i think um there are violent kids no question about it there always have been that's not going away um but have we lost the ability to deal with them i think that's what uh, some folks are questioning here, particularly uh, diane wheeler uh, well, as far I mean, as yeah, go ahead. I was going to say what what I heard what I what I heard from some of the state employees was um, the issue of transportation is tied to um, lack of services um, in the sense that um, we from from what they were telling me there aren't enough um, of certain kinds of overnight beds. So that if acuity increases, you know, if if I start acting out in a way that I'm going to need something um, that only can be addressed in Bennington County, then someone who's who is doing better, but probably could have stayed a bit longer if we tried. Um, if we did, so that there is, um, there, you know, we're moving people prematurely. And part of that is we need to find space. So we need to move one person out and one person in. So that also doubles the, the need for transportation. I, and I want to say, um, as, a represent, as a representative of Bennington County, um, the fact that we have these programs here, I think, is a testament to the community's openness. Um, many communities would not accept these types of programs. Um, and um, as the one, as the SEA and the CEAL, um, you know, it was not an easy thing to get a program started. And when you try to start a program in many communities, they reject it. And I think that um, the Bennington, Vermont School for Girls, I'm going to get that right eventually, Jeff. Um, you know, actually has three group homes within, I'm going to say, half a mile of my home. Um, one's in my backyard, one's just up the hill from me, and the other one's across the street from the one up the hill. Um, and we do not have problems with it um, as a neighbor. And uh, 
And I know down in, in Depot, I've had, you know, I had recently there were quite a few police cars there that, you know, some of the neighbors were concerned about it. But, um, that was one particular incident. So by and large, they're good neighbors, but most communities have not been as welcoming as the medical community has. And hopefully Newberry will be as welcoming as I, I'm sorry that it takes a long time to get to Bennington from St. Albans or wherever, um, but that's kind of a, a what's developed over the years. And Commissioner Brown, if you'd stop stealing the staff from these programs, um, you, you, <laughs> somebody mentioned that staffing had changed at Sea Hall when they were trying to. I do know that that staff member got taken by DCF. So. Yeah, our, our manager of our boys program took is now a social worker in Bennington. <laughs> well, it's certainly Anyhow. good to have those partnerships between our district <laughs> office and our, and our local <laughs> programs. Senator, if I could, if I yes. could just add. Yeah, now they're state employees. Right, that's, that's great. We, we're very happy to have that. <laughs> One thing I just wanted to add that um, people wanted me to, to say is that they don't disagree with what either you or Representative Pugh said, we need something. Um, and they also said it should be something that, to your point, that it's harder to get into, it was harder to get into Woodside than Harvard, that mm -hmm. a resource doesn't matter if you can't use it. Um, so they, they're, they're with you on that point. If we're gonna have something that's secure, uh, that it needs to be something that's actually accessible. I get one of the frustrations and I, I think the Department of Mental Health is still on Commissioner Squirrel. One of the things that I know has frustrated many folks, both in DCF as well as, is the uh, inability to get somebody into the retreat. Uh, Marshall Paul, last, um, uh, I think the last of our witness list, but not the least, obviously. Um, and Thank you. Commissioner Squirrel, did you want to comment on my comment about getting into uh, to, um, the retreat? No, I think uh, the, <clears throat> I understand the concern and certainly right now feel the, the pressure around accessing that resource. I just wanted to note to the committee that I do have to hop off to other testimony at 1030. Uh, right. So I just wanted to I, thank well, everyone for the opportunity. I'm sure Marshall wouldn't mind if you had any final comments that you wanted to make. No, just I think, you know, we're asking all the right questions. Um, I appreciate everyone's um, thoughtfulness around this because I agree from the community perspective, it can feel like eight doors to the same room. And I think it's our job here at the Agency of Human Services to ensure that we're providing, um, you know, timely access, integrated care and services and collaboration. So I think this conversation has given me a lot to think about. I am trying to focus on the solutions um, that we can try to bring yeah. to bear. I do think mobile response is important. Um, the other thing I would add to, particularly for transition age youth, um, we do notice that our CRT program, Community Rehabilitation Treatment and Support, um, some challenges in engaging some of those transition age youth who might be transitioning to adulthood um, in those mental health services. So I also do see that as an opportunity area for the Department of Mental Health um, to focus on. And of course, you know, we're happy to continue to engage in any of these kinds of discussions to try to strengthen the system of care. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thanks. Um, Marshall? Thank you, Senator. Um, so just to start by way of introduction, because I know there's some people yeah. in this hearing who uh, haven't been part of prior hearings. I'm Marshall Paul, I'm the Chief Juvenile Defender and Deputy Defender General. Um, and actually relevant to this conversation, uh, before I went to law school, I was not at the <clears throat> high level that everybody else in this hearing is, um, but I was a behavioral interventionist. Uh, I worked in a bunch of different programs just due to some oddities in the way that I was hired. I was used essentially as fill-in support for whatever program most needed somebody who was uh, restraint and escort trained. Um, so I have quite a bit of experience dealing with, uh, you know, very aggressive kids, both 
through my representation of those kids as a lawyer, um, and also prior to my role as a lawyer um, in programs working with those kids hands on. Um, and I wanted to start by, because I think there's been a lot of discussion that's been really important and really um, has covered a lot of the ground, you know, a lot of the things that I would like to talk about. But one of the things that I don't think has really been brought up is anything that provides some sort of context to this conversation uh, outside of the state of Vermont. Um, as chief juvenile defender, I'm in regular contact with my counterparts, chief juvenile defenders from all over New England and also from all over the country. And that's dealing both with the uh, juvenile- Just, just one second, uh, so Representative my... Pugh has to leave and I want to just let you know. Go ahead, Marsha. Um, thank you. So, the, um, so that's not only <coughs> dealing with the juvenile justice population, but also with the, uh, you know, nationally, they would always call it the child protective or the abused and neglected population. In Vermont, we call it the chins population. And one thing that I can say is, you know, I, I am in regular contact with my counterparts all over the country. And this is all that anybody is talking about right now. When you read the listservs for juvenile defenders all over the country, it's all conversations about the way that the pandemic has affected the ability to get kids in and out of placements in a timely manner. And it's affected, and, and that's really a lot of what we're talking about here. I mean, I think that, you know, this was framed as a conversation about how do we deal with kids who are displaying really aggressive, violent behaviors in residential settings. And everybody who's talked about it has focused on one part of the problem, which I think is appropriate, which is the, the responsiveness of the system when a kid's behavior does start to escalate. Is there, a play, is there an appropriate place for that kid to go? And can that, can that transition be made quickly and effectively and without disrupting you know, a, a whole bunch of some other program? You know, is it a situation where a kid needs to be moved out of one program before a kid can be moved in, that kind of thing? I think that's a really appropriate way for this conversation to go because that's really where these problems are. I mean, the problems that we're talking about, transportation is a huge problem. The number of these cases that have escalated to the point of charges. So I've ended up seeing the paperwork and I've ended up sort of looking back at what happened. In a lot of those cases, there's an effort made by a program or by a foster parent to try to address a problem that they can see coming, but they're unable to address it because they can't get a transport because there's no placement available. And it, it may be something where that transport is a few hours away or a placement is a few days away, but that's not fast enough. These situations escalate very quickly and it's really important for a system to be really responsive. And when someone says, look, this kid's behaviors have reached a threshold that we can no longer accommodate in our program, um, you know, we need to have a system that can absolutely respond to that quickly and respond to that effectively. What I don't think that means is that doesn't mean that we need secure beds all over the place. We don't need a new Woodside. We don't need to be putting, because a lot of these uh, kids were not appropriate for Woodside either. Just the fact that someone's engaging in, uh, destructive or aggressive behavior doesn't mean that what they need is a more secure placement. It may mean, mean that they need a more appropriate placement. And what I think one of the problems that we've seen with um, sort of how Woodside was used in the past and how other high level placements, you know, the placements that are designed for those high risk, high needs kids is that they're often sort of treated as an automatic ratcheting up where any time a kid in a program behaves, you know, a kid who's in a foster home behaves aggressively, that automatically results in them being placed in a more restrictive placement. Aggressive behavior there results in placement in a more restrictive placement. And we would see those kids accumulate at Woodside, even though really, honestly, it was in a lot of cases, the placements were just inappropriate. And kids who were 
who would behave aggressively at Woodside would actually we'd see significant reductions in their aggressive behavior when they left Woodside. Um, I remember actually two times when I had had staff at Woodside really upset um, that I had managed to get a kid out of Woodside, a kid who had wanted to get out of Woodside. I was advocating for them to get out of Woodside and I was successful at that. And I'm not suggesting that the Woodside staff's response was inappropriate. They just felt that, you know, with given that kid's behavior, um, there was going to be, you know, self-harm, that that kid was gonna hurt themselves or hurt someone else if they were removed from that very restrictive, very intensive program for high need, high risk kids. And yet when they were actually removed from the program, the behavior vanished. I mean, kids who had had, you know, one girl that I re remember who had some of the most profound and disturbing self-harming behaviors that I had ever seen any kid engage in. Um, and there was a lot of uh, concern when she was leaving Woodside. And yet when she moved to a different program, to a less restrictive program, an out of state program that was really specialized in trauma informed care and in treating the post traumatic stress disorder that she had, she had no more instances of self harm. I, I actually run into her, she's back in state. Um, she's aged out of the system. I run into her pretty much every time I go to court in St. Albans, uh, or not St. Albans, I'm sorry, St. Johnsbury. <laughs> I run into her in downtown St. Johnsbury. So I think the idea that, um, that we have a system that needs to be more responsive and that needs to have appropriate placements that are available on a very prompt basis is correct. But I think the, the idea that what that means is that we need more secure beds, more high level placements, more placements with higher levels of security isn't necessarily the case. Um, and so just to touch on a few of these things, the, the appropriateness of the placement, I think also, there's been these questions about what is it, you know, when is a kid charged for aggressive behavior or when is a kid uh, subject to being moved for aggressive behavior? And, you know, the problem with that question is that it, the answer is always it depends. It depends on the programs. It depends on the kid. It depends on the milieu. Um, you know, I've, it, and I think the important thing is for every program to be able to draw a line and say, this is the type of behavior that we are not gonna tolerate from this kid in this instance, in this milieu. And when they draw that line, to have that line respected so that when they say, look, this kid's behavior has escalated to a point that's no longer appropriate for this program, that they get moved quickly. And just to sort of give you an example of what that means, you know, there's kids the response to a kid, for example, who destroys some furniture um, and you can see that that destruction is an escalation of behavior that started down here and is escalating up to here and this destruction of furniture is right here, you know, that's, that's, that, that demands one type of response. Whereas a kid who destroys some furniture um, after getting horrible news, like that they're not gonna go home like that their parents' parental rights have been terminated, like that they will be, um, you know, any type of the, the kind of news that kids who are in these programs get all the time um, that triggers a kid who may not have been engaging in those kind of behaviors to then do something destructive, do something aggressive. That may demand, even though those are two identical behaviors in the same program, those may demand very different responses because they're very different kids acting, you know, maybe in the same way, but for very different reasons. And so I think that's got to be part of the conversation too. There's no cookie cutter to this. There's no one size fits all approach. Different programs have different reasons for tolerating different levels of behavior. Um, and I think part of the important thing is to ensure, you know, especially as DCF moves, I think very appropriately to you know, uh, to try to keep as many of these kids as possible in the most home-like community-based settings as possible. Um, you know, I think part of the 
equation is just making sure that we're responding appropriately to the behavior. You know, one of the things when I started doing uh, work at Woodside, Woodside was nearly always almost full. Uh, you know, there would be any, they'd, they'd try to keep the population down to around 25. So that there was enough room in there to uh, fit kids who were coming in on an emergency basis, but their maximum population was 30. And they were often up to 30. Um, and one of the things that used to fill up Woodside and doesn't anymore, and it's a really, it's a good thing, is we used to have kids who were brought in for stuff that would have never resulted in detention or you know, a, a, a justice system response if they were in, a, in their home, but it did result in that when they were in a foster home. So for example, you know, I have a 16 year old daughter. If she gets mad and slams, mad at me and slams the door so hard that it breaks the hinges or breaks the doorknob, not that she would do that, but if she did, you know, our response would not be to call the police and have her charged. Our response would be to take away her phone and make her fix the door and ground her for a few weeks. But if a kid's in foster care, it used to be the practice that um, in a lot of cases, when a kid engaged in that kind of behavior, which is really very normative adolescent behavior, I mean, there's no kid out there that doesn't unlawfully destroy property at some time in their adolescence and probably throughout their adolescence. It's, it seems to be what adolescents do is unlawfully destroy property. Um, but so we would see kids coming into Woodside who had engaged in that type of normative adolescent behavior, but because they did it in a foster home, it became a justice system issue rather than an issue that would be dealt with in the home. Um, that's one of the ways that sort of those placements at Woodside changed. It vastly reduced the number of kids at Woodside and it did so very appropriately. Like the fact that there's not as many kids in these high level secure placements is not a bad thing. It means that what we're making is more appropriate placements. And I think the testimony today reflects that what we really need to be doing is developing that middle system of placements, those kid, you know, those placements for kids who may not demand a fully secure, fully locked environment, because that's a very small number of kids for whom there is already a plan in place. It's developing a, a you know, a series of middle tier placements for kids who are of moderate risk, moderate need. You don't need fully secure setting, um, but there, where there's enough of those placements where for kids who are inappropriate in one placement, we can find the placement that's right for them and do it quickly and move them quickly. Well, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that over the years, I've seen a trend towards trying to fit square pegs into round holes and vice versa. And that's part of what um, you can't, uh, I, I always said, you can't ask a program to be all things to all people. And sometimes I think we do. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. And I take what you said, um, I actually wrote it down, Marshall. I thought it was a good summary of, of this issue is, it's critical that the system to be able to respond responsibly and quickly to the needs of the kids. And I think that really summarizes where we need to move and we need to, I don't expect a full report, but I hopefully the, the commissioners of mental health and DCF and maybe corrections can get together and talk about how to provide this. Because many of these kids come from homes where uh, perhaps the one parent is in jail, one parent is um, involved with the mental health system or substance abuse system, and, and, and the kids are in DCF custody and may or may not have been removed from the home. And I think that, that there needs to be better coordination. But also, <clears throat> you can't find the right program until there's been some stabilization and um, and that's where the 204s and 206s and gaps and horizons and other programs come in. And those programs providing that stabilization, um, when it gets so violent that you need something, as Diane Wheeler spoke to, 
to an urban map of the world. Um, I think that's where I'm hopeful the department will look at what is that, um, uh, what is that that, uh, you know, maybe it's only one kid every two months that needs something like Sununa that can be held um, for their own protection. In, in, in the um, Erica, did you want to comment a little bit on some of this? You're only, only asking ask that because I just emailed, uh, I just messaged Dick that I would don't want to say it, but I actually agree with Marshall. So um, <laughs> that's, that's just horrible. <laughs> which weirdly is happening more and more, but the, uh, at least on the juvenile issues. So, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that he, uh, it's true. We, if we could get um, just what Senator, just what you just said, there's going to be a couple cases here and there that I think we need uh, a higher level of um, interaction, but I mean, <laughs> absolutely right. These are the kinds of things that we would uh, just punish our kids at home for, right? You know, my son slams his door. Well, I take the door off the hinges for a couple of days and you know, the that seems to solve it. But when we're in uh, a situation where we have someone already in and we have to deal with the safety of employees, um, you know, we have to deal with the police responding repeatedly. Uh, we just have to come up with something else. And I think a home setting or something as close to a home setting that is secure and safe for both the people working there, but for the juvenile uh, on a short term basis, because it is the calls at two in the morning that create the issue. It's not, if it's during the work day, we almost always can problem solve a way to address the issue. I appreciate that, Eric. Very helpful. I, I cut in the middle of your um, remarks, Marshall, but I think they were, um, I think they well, were think setting was, a certain direction. And I think I was pretty much wrapped up. I mean, I think the only other things I would say is, um, you know, I agree <coughs> largely with Erica. I, I, you know, even though I've certainly disagreed with Stephen Howard on a lot of um, his concerns around the closure of Woodside, I actually agree with him on his concerns around the availability of transports, the interaction <coughs> between DCF and DMH, and the need for, you know, well-trained, what I would call therapeutic foster homes, and for intensive wrap services. Those have been very successful, and I know that DCF has been expanding, particularly their more skilled foster workers, uh, the availability of those. Um, and I think those are a real important part of the solution. I will say as far as the retreat goes, I mean, I've certainly experienced my share of frustrations with how kids are moved in and out of the retreat. Um, you know, I remember having kids at Woodside who would be at Woodside and immediately go into a state of crisis. They would be screened into the retreat and stabilized there for a few days, return to Woodside, immediately go into a state of crisis be screened back into the retreat. And I, you know, I think the girl I'm thinking of went through that transition like three times before uh, Woodside just decided they weren't going to screen her into the retreat anymore, which I don't actually think was necessarily the appropriate response, but was a response to the fact that it, the, the, you know, screening into the retreat had not been working um, because it was just this sort of back and forth, back and forth. And those transitions are really hard on kids. I mean, that's one of the things that we, that I've seen a lot of with my clients who are getting charged or getting probation violations or just simply getting in trouble for um, behavior in placements is a lot of it revolves around transitions, which a lot of times are out of those kids' hands. You know, I've had kids who have been sort of emergency transition from one program to another just to make space in that program who have then really decompensated because they've been moved from one program to another without any notice, without any preparation, without any planning. Um, and they're just sort of picked up from a place that they've called home for months and dropped into a new place without a lot of explanation. And that's resulted in, you know, increases in their level of aggression, increases in really maladaptive behavior and them winding up 
you know, picking up charges or VOPs um, as a result. So I think it is, you know, it's, I can't stress enough how critical it is to have a really well-developed system of care at all levels from, you know, the, from the foster care level, or even, you know, I, I think it was important for uh, that Stephen Howard talked about wrap services, which often are a way to keep kids out of foster care entirely and to be able to keep them in their own home and provide them with support that their parents can't provide, but without having to have them outside of their home. So um, I think that's that's all I have. I'm Any, happy to answer questions. Anybody else who would like to make some comments at this point? Any of the folks who's witnesses or Senate Judiciary Committee members who have comments to make? Mr. Brown? Uh, yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I do have to run to, to testify in House Human Services, and I just wanted to thank um, everyone for their testimony today. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you to Steve. You know, we are working closely with BSEA and our staff. You know, they are closest to the ground to, to you know, and so their feedback is critical here. And so we've been, um, you know, working with BSEA and taking their uh, concerns, and then also they've been sharing some ideas around high fidelity wraps and other things, and we're working through those. Um, suggestions right now and hopefully we can implement many of them because I agree um, you know that we do need to provide um, um, some additional supports to our foster kids and to our staff um, and to the system and I and I look forward to continuing this conversation you know with all of our partners on this because I think it will take all of us working together to, you know to, to provide a better system for our kids so I, I do I, appreciate the opportunity today um, and, and what I'd like to do is to reassemble this group the week after town meeting and get an update of where we're at. We'll know a little bit more, I think, hopefully we'll be, <coughs> be able to look at what things need to be in the budget, what things need to change in, in the statute. Um, how do we best approach this? And um, Diane and Erica have been excellent. Um, and also maybe giving us time to Senator White, myself, and uh, Sheriff Mark, and Sheriff Anderson, trying to see if we can't get the transport system to be no, more nimble to get the kid from St. Albans to Rattleboro, and Rattleboro to St. Albans, and Bennington to Newberry, or wherever it might be. Uh, those, these are not short trips. But it, it may be that. Um, we have to think outside the box for this transport system. That would be my suggestion. I, uh, Steve, I don't know if you have any further remarks or you've got more text. So, isn't this nice that we live in a world where we get text? I, 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 uh, yeah, I, you know, this morning I didn't know what a high fidelity wrap is. <laughs> I do now. <laughs> I've been spending most of the morning getting a quick uh, education from our members. So I think I, that's what you provide, Tilly, or Tilly provides for you. Yeah, not the name of your dog. Yeah, well, right. I mean, she probably would eat it if I could, if I had. <laughs> but uh, I'll just say that I, I knew this day would come. I knew Marshall would see the light eventually, and agree with me. Uh, and I, uh, I look forward to working. Our members do look forward to working uh, with uh, Commissioner Brown. Um, there's a substantial amount of work to do, but I think they're willing to roll up their sleeves and, um, and make uh, those changes happen. Any committee members with comments or questions? What the next step might be? Jim and Laura and, and Jeff, you're certainly important partners in this. Um, and just because I represent you in the Senate doesn't mean that that's not the only reason I'm saying that. It's just that, that you're providing that stabilization and you're providing uh, important service. Um, and I, I think what I, beyond what Marshall said, I think we also have to recognize the impact of COVID on, on all of this. Um, on you know your ability to provide staffing, for example, programs. Um, you know the, the number of, of kids who have come in. Um, Commissioner Brown, you've had to hold up on some of the kids entering programs because of the COVID issues. You had to 
reduce the number of entrances. Uh, again, I think we need to also recognize that <clears throat> that's been an important part of uh, this problem. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Committee, um, any other comments from Alice? You worked in this. Jeanette, you have the retreat in your district. Um, Joe, you're a defense attorney. Uh, Senator Ruth, anybody comments? Oh, so, so just um, many of the same problems exist right here and now that were existing 20 years ago when I worked for DCF for a number, for a long, long, long time. And the um, opioid crisis has, of course, and now COVID has had a big impact. But really the issues still remain that were there uh, that long ago and continue. I think there's maybe some new ideas for with regard to treatment, which is good to hear. Um, and it's, it's a lot of people struggling and a lot of um, the people caring for them struggling. There was one, um, perhaps Commissioner Brown remembers uh, from his other experience, there used to be specialized um, foster homes who would, it was kind of like some people talked about a place for where instead of going into a residential placement, you could go into one of those very specialized. <clears throat> there were only a few of them around the state, but they seem to work. And I don't know if they, if any of them still exist or not. Yeah, I think that they were referred to as therapeutic foster homes, a higher level of foster home. And we are looking at trying to expand the capacity of, you know, I think there might be a one or two still out there, but um, I think that's an area where we, we're looking to expand our capacity for sure in the system. Uh -huh. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator White. I was just going to comment on the uh, need for different approaches to treatment. And I don't know if this is the case that Marshall was talking about, but there was, I do know of a girl who was bounced back and forth between the retreat and Woodside. And Woodside in staff, it was a difference between approach and Woodside staff insisted that she needed a higher level of care. So she was sent to the retreat. The retreat did not feel that she needed that. They sent her back. But ultimately, the retreat said, we're not going to do it anymore. And she should go live with her grandmother. And there was a huge um, outcry from the staff at Woodside who said, She's dangerous. She can't go live with her grandmother. And they did because they had no alternative. They sent her to live with her grandmother and she's been fine ever since. Her, her level of trauma went down because she wasn't, every time she went to Woodside, the, she, her, the adrenaline rush was there and she um, experienced that trauma again. And then, so we do need alternatives and we do need to look at the individual person instead of, like Marshall said, just um, having steps. So I just wanted to comment on that. Joe? So just to let the committee know, institutions had a fairly lengthy conversation on Wednesday about a portion of this conversation with a facility that is in the planning works right now for um, Newbury, Vermont would handle six beds as a replacement of sorts for um, Woodside, but it's only to handle the male population. And so the conversation continues, but I just wanted the committee to know we've been having fairly lengthy conversations in institutions about this particular facility. And if all goes well, uh, the hope is that it will be up and running before the end of the year. Um, thank you. I, um, Bryn and, and Peggy, if we could arrange for a similar meeting um, the week after um, meeting. <clears throat> Diane and Erica and others, um, I appreciate the testimony and how do we um, provide that for the most serious um, violent kids to help protect them in the community and, and uh, others. Um, is there a way to work with DCF and Sununu or even the Department of Corrections? And, um, and as we start to see 18 and 19 year olds in the adult system, that's another area, I mean, in the juvenile system with the 
rate with the raise the age legislation. Are, are we prepared for that group as well? It's another part of that conversation that I think we need to have. Maybe in March we can do that. And Bryn, if you could remind us of the raise the age and <clears throat> a little bit uh, before the March conversation uh, and how, and, and talk a little bit about what we're doing there. And, and because I fear that that some kid will have some huge problem and it'll become the cause celeb to go backwards. Yeah. I don't know that there's any necessary, I, there may be appropriations issues that need to be dealt with on the transport. I really think that's, uh, Area that's identified. And I don't know if Commissioner Brown, you have other things in terms of budget wise you, uh, that we can work through this, this family services. Uh, uh, um, we just received um, a request to review some appropriations language um, for the BAA um, regarding some new additional services. Um, in response to the conversation we're having today. And so we're reviewing that and we'll be um, responding back with our thoughts on, on those um, appropriation requests. Well, three members of this committee are on Senate appropriations. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Actually, we're a quorum of this committee when we meet in appropriations. Never thought of that. 